we believe that cancers acquire capabilities and that these capabilities are all to, to some uh, to some approximation necessary to to produce a successful tumor and and these may not be a complete description of a tumor but they probably just in the same way that if you describe a car as having a motor and some wheels and tires and a gas tank and, and some brakes uh, you haven't completely described the car but you've described a lot of the capabilities uh, that allow it uh, to do what it does and so I think the same issue here is is that tumors have a set of uh, a minimal set of capabilities that, that we think are necessary and so we call these the hallmarks of cancer cancer cells have to learn how to grow in the absence of growth stimulatory signals that normal cells require from their environment. Cancer cells have to learn how to grow in the presence of growth inhibitory signals that normally succeed in stopping the proliferation of normal cells. Not only are there positive uh, signals that say grow, uh, but there are breaks which attempt to store, which serve normally to stop such proliferation and uh, the loss of these uh, growth control uh, signals, these negative growth controls, is again a common uh, denominator for many cancers. And this is, and these are, this is separable in some sense from the growth stimulation. It's very much like putting your your foot on the gas pedal. You put your foot on the gas pedal, the engine revs up, but if you've got your foot on the brake, you still may not go anywhere. So these are, you know, again conceptually, although they both relate to the ability of the cell to divide continuously, they each have separable uh, capabilities. Which Cancer cells have to learn how to avoid the process of programmed cell death, suicide, otherwise known as apoptosis. that a fundamental property of, of uh, multicellular organisms is the capability to commit suicide or undergo apoptosis, which is a form of programmed cell death. And it is evident that this is another check and, a bal and balance on aberrant tissues, so that early on in the development of many cancers one can see prominent induction of apoptosis which we imagine to be, a, uh, again, a protective, uh, a form of protection for the organism. The cells are, are proliferating aberrantly and they uh, therefore commit suicide for the common good. Cancer cells have to learn how to become angiogenic, that is to say, attract blood vessels to grow into the tumor mass, thereby providing the, the tumor with nutrients and with glucose, with oxygen, and evacuating metabolic wastes and carbon dioxide. As a cell, you need oxygen to, br to breathe in the same way that the organism does. And that dividing nests of cells will, in some sense, suffocate from lack of nutrients and oxygen and from their own waste unless they have a blood supply. And it is now clear that induction of new blood vessel growth, the process of angiogenesis, is critical for almost all cancers. And some less than others, perhaps the leukemias and the bloodborne ones are less angiogenesis dependent, but it may be that all cancers, in some sense, activate the vascular system to help support it. Normal cells can only double a certain limited finite number of times. Cancer cells have to learn how to proliferate indefinitely, i.e. they have to become immortalized.
the machinery for controlling how often a cell may grow and divide, how many generations a lineage of cells may pass through, is carried in the telomeric DNAs at the ends of chromosomes. The telomeres are specialized sequence at the ends of each chromosome, and they operate to prevent the end-to-end -end fusion of chromosomes. These telomeres protect the ends of chromosomal DNA from such accidents. And as was learned in a number of laboratories, when normal cells go through cycles of growth and division, their telomeric DNA gets shorter and shorter and shorter, and ultimately so short that it can no longer protect the ends of chromosomal DNA. Telomeres start fusing, the DNA chromosomes start fusing in those cells, and those cells die. Cancer cells must avoid that problem because they want to grow indefinitely. And what do they do? They turn on an enzyme called telomerase that is normally expressed only early in embryologic development, and in a small number of so-called stem cells in the body. The telomerase enzyme that is able to extend the telomeres, making them longer and longer, thereby enabling the cancer cell to go through many, many cycles of growth and division without worrying about the imminent collapse of its telomeres. The telomerase ensures that the telomeres stay very long. The nature of the, of the replication machinery is that chromosomes get smaller every time they divide. And we now appreciate that specialized cells in the body have a way to counteract this telomere shortening. And uh, that's using a, a several strategies, of which the most prominent is an enzyme uh, known as telomerase that protects the ends of chromosomes from this erosion. Cancer cells also have to learn how to invade and metastasize. And um, that, in fact, uh, is uh, involved in the inactivation of a whole series of controls that normally confines a cell to the site in the tissue where it normally grows, enabling these cells to, in fact, move to other sites in the body. Cancers kill you in general, not just because they grow into a large lump, but because they invade into normal tissues and disrupt the functions of those tissues, and they develop the ability to migrate to distant sites in the body. And this, these capabilities of invasion and metastasis, uh, which, uh, which are very closely linked, but, are, but perhaps have separable aspects as well, are, are very important for the fatality of most cancers. And, and this is the one that's perhaps least connected to simple cell growth and accumulation of the cells, but actually uh, producing cells that, that really are able to uh, sustain themselves, expand, uh, and, and, and migrate. There are two uh, what are called adaptive immune responses. And those immune responses uh, adapt to changes in cells in our body, whether they be by infection or other changes, perhaps such as cancer. That two arms of the adaptive immune response, uh, one arm is making antibodies produced by B cells. And these antibodies bind and uh, direct the elimination of those cells. The other uh, part of the immune response is the T-cell immune response, where T-cells actually kill uh, cells that are changed in our body. But there's constant surveillance 
of the cells in our body so that emerging precancerous or pretumor cells would be eliminated by the immune response. A very exciting area of immunology is what's called adjuvant therapy. And this is where you uh, stimulate the body's immune, immune system with uh, agents that activate the immune system and make them hyper uh, sensitive to these foreign cells in our body, such as cancer cells. And there are a number of clinical trials going on now where the immune system has been enhanced by these kind of adjuvant or stimulant therapies. And uh, there has been some success, although I think there's still a lot of research in this area to do. A characteristic of cancer cells is that those cells have changes in the nature of the genes that are compared to the normal cells. These changes can be either mutations or the deletion of whole genes, or they can be the addition of extra copies of genes. This is called genomic instability. The changes in our genes that accumulate in cancer cells can be acquired by a number of mechanisms. One is that during the process of copying the genetic information, mistakes can be made. Using computer animation based on molecular research, we are now able to see how DNA is actually copied in living cells. You are looking at an assembly line of amazing miniature biochemical machines that are pulling apart the DNA double helix and cranking out a copy of each strand. The DNA to be copied enters the production line from bottom left. The whirling blue molecular machine is called helicase. It spins the DNA as fast as a jet engine as it unwinds the double helix into two strands. One strand is copied continuously and can be seen spooling off to the right. Things are not so simple for the other strand because it must be copied backwards. It is drawn out repeatedly in loops and copied one section at a time. The end result is two new DNA molecules. After the genetic information is copied, it has to be segregated to the two daughter cells. During that segregation process, it is often that the numbers of genes get distributed uh, unevenly to those daughter cells. A third way is that cancer cells have an inability to repair alterations in the DNA. That you need to acquire multiple changes in the genes, multiple genes, to get a full blown cancer. Estimates to be about five to seven genes, perhaps, on average. That those changes accumulate over a period of time. Some of those changes accelerate the rate of accumulation of, of that. Right? What's interesting is that some of them are inherited ahead of time. So BRCA1, for instance, you are, in, you are born with one of the niches already taken out of your belt. And then uh, to accumulate the other four or five changes, you're already on the way. And that's why there's a higher probability of getting cancer.